our planet. It's a lonely spot in the great cosmic dark. Hi, this is Chrissy. And I'm Marie. And you're listening to Alt Pop Repeat. A show where we get into the nitty-gritty around counterculture, alternative culture, and sync it up with what? With pop culture. Yeah, man. That's what we do. There we go. High five. (laughs) Hey, Marie. (laughs) Hey, Chrissy. Would you like to do a quiz? I would love to do a quiz. You ready? Oh, I'm ready. Okay. So now you can guess what our segment's going to be about. Yeah, <laughs> everybody listening quiz. in, you can figure this right. out. Scroll to start quiz. Okay, scroll to start. What best describes yoga? A spiritual discipline? An acrobatic workout? A competitive sport? A diet? Uh, so what was the first one? Spiritual. What best describes yoga? A spiritual discipline? Yes. Spiritual discipline. Okay, you can. They actually say if you want a hint here, we'll give you a hint too, just in case you don't know. Yeah, they're probably it's like call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Just I call, should bring. You should call a friend actually. But if you're not sure, we're calling a friend. <laughs> Could you imagine? We'll call Andre and we're like, hey, Andre. Sure, call Andre and we'll see what he says. <phone rings> Ready? Okay. Hello. Hey, hey, we got a question for you. Yeah. Yeah. What does Namaste mean? So you get to pick out of four questions. Breathe deep. Think about your tasks. I bow to you, strength. Oh. Pick one. Pick one. I'm guessing three. Three. I bow to you. Okay, we'll call you back and let you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to do the rest of the quiz. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, bye. 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 Namaste. Bye. <laughs> Namaste. So that's Andre, if you guys don't know. He actually helps edit the show with us. Is that it? Okay. So no, I, there's a million oh, other there's questions. So, many of them. so we don't really know if Andre if Andre's question was right. What was Yeah, that? it does. It says when you click on it. Mm-hmm. And he said, I bow to you. That's correct. So we should segue then to who our guest is, since you guys know obviously we're talking about yoga. So who's our guest today, Marie? Our guest is Faith Hunter. Yes, Faith Hunter um, is the owner of Embrace Yoga DC. She also has Embrace OM, and then she also has Spiritually Fly. So she's all these amazing brands that are associated in what she does. This omnipotent being who is, when you listen to the interview, you will hear a woman that is incredibly grounded and comfortable in her spirituality practice. Totally. And she was, you know, we talked with her about yoga, like why yoga now? Intersectionality in yoga and the wellness community, um, energy exchanges and uh, everything in between. So I say, let's roll into the interview. Yeah. And in the end, we sync, we it, sync up. it up. How did you get into yoga? <laughs> so my uh, my introduction to yoga was way before I even decided to to jump on the mat. Um, oddly enough, when I was in high school, I saw some videos I think on PBS of Rodney Yee, and I was like, oh yeah, I can do that stretching stuff. I didn't even own a mat. I wasn't even that interested in yoga. I was just like, oh yeah, I'm a dancer, stretching. This looks cool. Blah blah blah. And then I kind of left it alone. However, right around probably like 94, my, my older brother was in the hospital um, dying from complications related to AIDS. And one of my friends was like, you know, I heard this yoga thing helps you relax. You need to go practice some yoga. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. I'll give anything a try just for me to like decompress and reset um, because I knew that I needed that because I was angry. I was frustrated, but I was also like really, really sad because I knew he was coming towards the end. And so I started practicing yoga then. And from there, it just became this essential part of my life. And I had to continue on the path just as 
for my own personal health and well-being. I was reading about your your brother and and what was happening as well too going through that time. So when you now started building, you have like Embrace OM and then you have Embrace Yoga DC and then you you have, you know, Spiritual Fly, like you have all of these things that mm-hmm. have now kind of stemmed from that that moment. When you kind of went in and started using mindfulness, did that bring you to a journey of, you know, understanding the East and then bringing that kind of to the West? Totally. I think for me as, you know, once I became a yoga teacher, it was probably like around 2003 and I was starting to be introduced to a variety of, you know, techniques and approaches and philosophies that were, you know, very, very rooted in ancient healing techniques. And from that yoga teacher training, it just like expanded my world in such a gigantic way. Then years later, I decided to move to DC. Um, And when I returned to DC and I was just like in this zone of like, I need to offer up something different because I was teaching at other yoga studios and I just felt like I didn't fit, but also I felt like they weren't bringing the truth. And then I say, when I say the truth, it's the truth of the soul. It's the truth of the essence of love. It's the truth of acceptance and openness. And I said that I needed to offer something different. And the way that I knew how to do that, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to open up my space because I can own it. I can teach in the way that I want to teach that's very rooted to my, my personal alignment, to my soul. But then as people, as I bring other teachers in, my goal has always been, Tap into the wisdom of the ancient teachings, but really teach from your soul and teach like you and share what you have. And so what I've done is really beautifully blended those ancient techniques and fitted them kind of sweetly in this little little compact giving box that's blended with modern living. I mean, because that, I mean, I, I would love to just like hang out and sit underneath a tree and meditate. Totally. But, <laughs> how exciting that would be, but I would prefer to do it by the beach. Um, <laughs> But I know that that's not, that's not our reality. That's not, that's not our earthly reality. And our earthly reality is to, to be in the mix of life and draw upon those tools and those techniques that are going to serve us. On Can you give path. us some examples of that? Like, just because you have this, uh, you know, wellness meets culture concept with it and, you know, ancient meets modern hailing tools with yoga. M O. So like, yeah. what are, what are some of the things that you do as a practice to kind of combine those like counterculture from the East all the way to the West? I think probably right now, one of the, the biggest, there, there's two things because, you know, all of us have been in quarantine since March, you know, in different ways. And the way is like responding to what is happening in our current culture um, of this level of isolation. And so for me as a teacher and some of my other teachers, we've kind of adjusted the way that we are teaching in order to serve people that are in quarantine, that are experiencing our teachings through Zoom um, and, you know, and other um, platforms. And that is about sometimes slowing down. Um, We've added more breath work, more meditation. I know in my teaching, I've kind of shifted the way that I'm moving and I'm very, very conscious of the chakras and that, that personal alignment. One of the other ways that we are, I've been doing it and some of my other teachers is that I talk a lot about my personal spirituality and that that's the way that I live in the world, but that blends and, and rides this same line of, of my politics and my advocacy. And so when I think about the aspect of, you know, human rights and, and racism and systemic racism specifically and black lives matter, I think it is so important that those are not, those topics aren't like put over here and like, I'm going to go to yoga and I'm going to sit under my tree. Right? No, 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 no let it come up, feel it. And so allowing the breath work, the physical movement to complement and support what people are moving through when it comes to all of the current cultural issues that we're experiencing collectively. That's so interesting you say that because Chrissy and I have had conversations about uh, intersectionality and fitness and that for a long time, the wellness and the fitness industry has really been dominated by one type of image, which is like the healthy white female. Mm -hmm. And how do you think we can move away from that? And what does that look like? 
what does wellness look like outside the paradigm of the healthy white female? Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting because I, I was uh, I was actually doing a call yesterday. We kind of were having this exact same conversation, and I think the way that the wellness industry can make that shift away from that very typical skinny blonde white woman practicing yoga, very affluent. I think that we really as a as a wellness culture, like as a wellness community, we have to dig deep inside of who we are individually and understand that everyone deserves this wellness experience. And as a business owner, right, and I put myself in that I as a business owner, and I think other business owners, regardless if they're selling a product, they're selling a yoga mat, um, or if they own a yoga studio, they have to go inside as well and go, you know what? I need to make some shifts because I want to make sure that my services are accessible and available to all. And it's not saying that you have to offer up everything that's free, but what you have to do is really be respectful and honor the expertise of BIPOC communities that are actually healers and guides and really, really passionate teachers out there. And not just assuming, oh, they're going to pull up the tough questions or they're going to discuss race in, a, in their yoga class and I'm not going to hire them for that. Wellness has always been like the whole foods. It has always been, you know, these yoga, um, very expensive yoga memberships. And I know yoga as an ethos generally is it's, you should be able to access it for free through energy exchanges. Uh, and anybody listening in energy exchanges, someone is offering their services in exchange for instruction or classes. Um, but how how is this how are we shaping this entire industry to allow people who might not necessarily have the same affluence as someone else to access fitness or healthcare or wellness mm. is it possible that we need to start going back to the original teachings of yoga to take a look at where did that come from because really meditation is free mm -hmm. mindfulness is free it's free yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that you said the energy exchange, because that's really what it is. It's like, I always pride myself on being the ultimate barterer. <laughs> I barter for so much, <laughs> especially when it comes to the services within my studio. I'm like, okay, I need some construction work done. What can I do in exchange or at least some legal services done? And part of that is the energy exchange. It's like, yes, you know, when you think about the the ancient healers, right, um, and regardless of what culture they came from, right, if they, they were in India or Africa, or, you know, or, or here in North America, I mean, you think about our indigenous community. And so you think about these healers, they would, people would come to them and say, you know what, I, my heart is, my heart is heavy. I need help, right? And so what they would do is provide food, provide shelter. Like there was this exchange of energy. So it's not like what we are offering as healers should be free, but what we are offering is we are not solving their problems. We are delivering a service. And then that is providing that energy exchange and that, that gifting. And then from there, they will give something back. The other thing I think is really important and the, thing that happens within the yoga community and within the wellness community, not even yoga, within the wellness community, is that other ancient healing practices are not honored and really highlighted within yoga and meditation. It's like, oh, it came from India. This is it. This is the way. This is the path. And the only thing, oh my God, why, why would you dare blend something else into the mix? And so again, kind of coming back to one of your first questions, the way that I ensure that this wellness community starts to create a more open path is really presenting a variety of wellness and healing techniques and technologies merged into the very traditional yogic Vedic way of, of enlightenment. So one example and way that I do that is I will, I, I, I love Tara. And so sometimes I will, take my Terra deck, but my Terra deck is an Orisha Terra deck that um, is, is African based. And so all of the images are very African based. And so when I like start the class, I'll do my deck, 
pull a card and then I'll show, you know, my students, because we're doing this on Zoom now, I'll show my students this card. And then I go into the story around the energy of this deck or the energy of that card that's very, very African based. But then it's coming back to that aspect of although these ancient technologies feel like they're on one end and like, you know, Indian Vedic is like up here and everything else is down here. No, it's all energy exchange. The ancient energy exchange and they should blend. That's really beautiful. It is. I, you know, we see all these different types of yoga to these practices now that the West has started like beer yoga, goat yoga, you know, like there's so many different types. Do you think now, because, you know, I would say, you, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you know, before there was maybe, you know, five or nine, like there's not really, there was a, a certain amount of types of yoga practices. And now we have, I would say hundreds of them. Do you think that has changed the value then of yoga because of that? And that people are coming out with these new types of, of forms of yoga, or is it just helping the movement? I think it, it kind of goes both ways. I think it definitely, I always say, however you show up on the mat, is the way you show up. Like if you show up on the yeah, mat with yeah. a, a goat on your back, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, let's let's hope that we go beyond that, right? But let's hope that your spiritual, your your wellness journey goes a little bit beyond the goat hanging out on you. Okay, totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, or, you know, or a beer in your yeah. hand, like however you get there, that's fine. But once you get there, then it's up to you to take more steps. It's up to you to do the exploration and discovery. Um, what I feel in terms of like everyone coming out with these different forms and ways and shapes, it's, it's not necessarily about we have to stick with the, the, the very ancient tools, but we do have to honor, kind of going back, we do have to honor the energy of the human spirit, the energy of the human soul. And each and every one of us wants to elevate, wants to expand, wants to be greater. And if this practice, whatever it is that you are sharing and teaching will help and support people moving forward, then that's what you share. If you need to label it and tag it in some way, do that. I mean, I, I'm definitely have my own particular approach to this practice, but I don't call it spiritually fly yoga. It's the spiritually fly approach to life, right? Because I'm, I'm bringing everything and not like separating. Here's the physical body. Here's the breath work. Here's the meditation. No, it's all compacted because that's who we are. We aren't these little tiny pieces floating around. We're this amazing human spirit that's allowing the physical form to to shift and move and to grow and the practices should support that regardless of how they're labeled and named do you think that there's any practices that are detrimental like i don't necessarily like asking negative questions but Mm -hmm. um you seem to have a very grounded idea that if it's out there and it gets you involved in the practice regardless of whether you have a goat on your back or you are whatever it is as long as you get on that mat and you get started on your journey that's valid but is there anything that's out there that really is detrimental to getting people on that mat? Yeah. You, you know, I, I can't think of any particular style at the moment, but I definitely have major issues with instructors that um, are very demanding and don't honor people's bodies and people's, people's hearts and feelings. Um, when we are teaching, maybe myself and as well as the rest of my staff, when we're teaching, we're very, very mindful and aware of where people are sitting. So providing people with a variety of options, not forcing them into particular postures that don't feel good and, and don't honor their body type, because that's also a big thing. It's like, oh, well, stuck in your belly. Well, you know, maybe that's not going to happen. Like really thinking about the language that we are using in order to share. And so I think the demanding yoga teachers, wellness instructors that are demanding that people push themselves beyond their point, like it's a difference between supportive and like providing people with a little nudge and saying, you need to do this in order to get to there. It's kind of like, it reminds me of being in church. <laughs> Well, if you don't take communion, you're going to go to hell. I mean, it's just like, if you're not safe, like, it's like, I hate when people try and force me into boxes. Um, but then also the other aspect of really honoring the variety of body types um, and really honoring where people are sitting in their own spiritual and, and awakened journey. 
um, and really good teachers know how to read that, even if it's across the screen. Yeah, I think so too. Like when I got introduced to yoga the first time, it was something that was giving me mindfulness. And then when I went into a class the first time, like I, I always talk about Cheryl, she's, she's like my, she is like, of any form, the best yoga teacher I've ever, ever had. And when I go and I sit with her and she doesn't even really know this and how much I appreciate her. And it's exactly that energy exchange that we have. But I walked into her class and when I came out, I could tell, I was like, why am I not doing yoga? Why have I not been doing this my entire mm-hmm. life? Because I think that people are taught in yoga and the Western culture kind of has changed this, that yoga is for the body and it's not always for the mind. You know, and I think that there has to be this education that goes around that you're doing and other people are doing or saying, you know, sometimes working out is great and it is great for the body and it's great for loosening up and and stretching, but it's also, you know, working out your mind and working out other things. Do you see people that go into your classes and kind of maybe start going in to just do it as an exercise to lose weight? And then when they come out, they're actually maybe a little more transformed because they have a different understanding of maybe what mindfulness is. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I don't know over the years, how many people have stepped into my class or to my studio and you could just tell when they initially come in it's all the physical I mean the the, the physicality is is on 10 and then after a couple of loops meaning in and out practicing with us they're like wait a minute all right something shifting within me and so then you kind of see almost like their force of the physical start to kind of peel away, right? And there's this concept actually within the practice of yoga um, that's called the koshas and it's like these sheets. And I always like to describe it as a blooming onion. Um, And so what happens is that on that outer shell is all the physical. So, you know, all of us have that very tangible skin. And then slowly as we move through the practice, and sometimes this takes multiple practices, that physical aspect starts to peel off. And so we're not so obsessed with the physical. Then we're like, okay, then comes like my awareness of really knowing that the breath is my guide. And that's that moment I feel when people start to shift. And it's always beautiful to see when the, that, outer layer starts to soften and they come to the mat with just their, their breath and their their hearts. Um, And it's okay. Even if that's the only hour that they have during the week, but that's like a gift to themselves. And then when they're in that moment of awareness, it's, it's beautiful to see. Where do you see the culture of yoga going then in the future or where would you like it to go? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would like it, and I think it is moving in that direction. I think that it is becoming much more, you know, spiritually centered. And, you know, and I I use that word in a very broad sense of people are tapping into their own essence. They're tapping into their own hearts. They're listening to their own personal and deepest desires. Um, And they're navigating whatever life they're choosing with this element of mindfulness. And that is happening as a result of these wellness tools and technologies that we're sharing. And I really believe that the industry will start to follow suit. And as the industry evolves, right? I feel like on the external, right, people will start to evolve. Like it's almost like we're moving together. So it's like as the yoga teachers that are much more rooted um, and still tapped into the, the highest, as those teachers start to share and be authentic, because I mean, I, you know, I remember when I first started teaching yoga, I, I wasn't in that same place of personal expression where I am now. I was very, very scared to share what was really going on in my heart and and spinning in my mind and what I knew I wanted to share. Like there wasn't this level of confidence. And so I, I sat for a very long time in that little mold of what I thought people wanted and what they wanted from me as, as, as a black yoga teacher and, and, and as a woman, and, you know, as a black woman, because that also has its own level um, of shifts that happen. So I'm hoping that the wellness industry will continue to evolve on a higher plane and not sit any longer in these very superficial, very 
molded, crafted images. And we have to, to break out of that. I just was wondering, why are people into yoga now? Why are people coming back to spirituality now? Because I mean, you look at the 80s, people were freaked out by salads. Like we <laughs> went from being very hardcore, like science engineered everything. And now we're all like, Everyone's a guru. Everybody <laughs> wants to be a guru. Everybody, yeah. wants, everybody wants to be a guru. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So why? Yeah. Why now? Why? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, hey, I, Christian Marie. I think here on our planet, we, we're experiencing some major shifts. I mean, um, astrologically, the planets are moving and shifting in a way where, I mean, this is very loopy, but it, it, we're energetically, things have to shift and change. We can't be continuing on this path of like industrial, like churning the machine. And, you know, I was talking to one of my friends today about being on the hamster wheel. It's like, you know, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing and it's going to work. It's going to work. I'm going to go faster and do it. That's where we have as a, a world been. And then all of a sudden people start jumping off. And when people start jumping off the hamster wheel, they yeah. started to like feel and experience things differently and see things differently because now you can look completely around you in a full circle instead of going in this very, very linear way. And as people started jumping off, people start waking up to what they want. And I really believe part of the, the hamster wheel spiritually that people have been on is really tied to that patriarchy that is rooted in our religious practices, you know, very formalized religious practices. Women are bad. They're dirty. <laughs> Don't listen to them. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. And, yeah. and then follow the man because that's what he has to do. But then the thing that people don't get is that we as women our creators. We are plugged into the divine far more than a man. And I, you know, and I say that with fullness and power because I honestly believe it. I mean, we are the creators of so many magnificent things. And many of us have jumped off the wheel. And when we jumped off, we expanded. Regardless if we're like, I'm going to be a yoga teacher, even if it's the simple fact of like, I'm going to be a trailblazer in whatever industry that I'm in. But the, in order for me to be a trailblazer, I have to see things differently and I have to approach the way that I'm moving in this path of my choice and my career that's very, very different than my male counterparts. And so I believe because people have started to take that jump, that's why this industry has exploded. And that's why people are now craving because even if you jump off, sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. And so you have to search and find that teacher that's going to speak to you and then they'll help turn on the light bulb and then you can expand. Yeah. I'm all about numbers apparently in the show, but so <laughs> I like I like to guess. I like do you to, got some stats for me, Chrissy? I do. I have some stats. Holy! Let me put on my glasses. Um, all okay, right. Look, so offensive ready? test nerds. That, right. I am one of them, so I'm allowed to make fun of myself <laughs> in many ways. I wish I looked good in glasses, but I just don't. All right. How many types of yoga do you think there are? How many types of yoga? Yes. Uh, 156. Okay, that's way too high, but you <laughs> might be right. <laughs> well, I, here's the thing. Honestly, here's the thing: is that we. When I looked it up, I went, Google, how many types of yoga are there? Some say there's five, some say 11, some say eight. And so I emailed a friend and said that does kundalini yoga, which is a type of yoga. Yep. And I asked her, how many type, types of yoga do you think there are? And she's like, five? Like she didn't even know. So I really think that, and then I saw multiple different numbers of different types of yoga. So what I'm getting at is that there's so many different types of forms of yoga now that the counterculture form of yoga, I would say back then was probably between 11, maybe five during the counterculture moments of yoga. Now that we've moved into modern day, there's so many different types. So the ones that we know are Kundalini. We have Bikram yoga, which is hot yoga. Yeah. We have yin yoga 
And then there's things like aerial yoga, there's vinyasa yoga, there's flow yoga, then there's like goat yoga, there's beer and wine yoga. But what I'm getting at is that yoga is transferred into so many different types of yoga that now, before, it was very based on an Eastern thing and the Western has taken it and has really made it on its own. So if I'm going to open up a sink, I'm in a modern sink, I'm going to open it up with there's so many different types of yoga now that we can't keep track of them because they ever they are ever evolving because of the influence of popular culture. Yeah, and I I think there's this I I feel like I'm the one that whenever we're talking about the counterculture to pop culture on any any topic on the show, I'm the one that's like waving the appropriation flag, appropriation flag, woo 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 because it really is it very much was associated with a practice that resonated or originated in India and came over to North America. And usually when that happens and people start gravitating towards it, then they start co-opting it and they start turning it into other things. I um I really love it when people take ownership of a an art form like yoga and they're they're turning into other things. But I just think it's also really important to know the distinction that there is traditional forms of yoga. And then there's these other practices that are based upon yoga, but it's not quite because there's different gurus that came out with each different practice. Like, obviously, everybody knows hot yoga, kundalini yoga also came from another guru. Yeah, and that's the modern form that it's evolved to. So that sink of the evolution of yoga from different types of yoga, I would say is our our first one. And so I'm all for this modern sink of moving into all these different types of yoga, because if it gets people moving and it gets them into their bodies and it takes them out of their minds or sometimes into their head, if that makes sense, the way that they find mindfulness, then if you want to do puppy and goat yoga, you go do that. If you want to do tree yoga, if you, I don't know, if you want to do balcony yoga, like I, I don't care. I'm, I'm in for yoga and to the practice of being able to find mindfulness. And I find that these new forms that people are doing are, are helping them for that, or they're helping them to get into their body to ground. And I right. think that's really important because that's something we don't really have anymore. Well, it goes back to the, society. the name of yoga comes from to unite and universal consciousness. So even if you want to be yeah. the, well, that's what yoga means in Sanskrit. So yeah. even if you go back to what the term itself means, as long as you are sitting within that space and yoga is yoga is there to be taught yoga is was created to be shared in the spirit of yoga it 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 is it is a free practice and then it gets into which is why handy hint for anybody listening to the show that doesn't know this handy little trick if you want to practice yoga you can do it for free and most studios that operate will have something called an energy exchange and it's a way that modern yoga studios are able to keep the the original ethos and commitment of yoga as a free practice to people. So the energy exchange is, is that you volunteer your time to the yoga studio and in exchange, you get classes for free. And uh, some people can translate that into teacher training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like this There's this oneness within the yoga community, and there is a big conversation, which we are not discussing today in the show. I will be very clear about this. We are not going to be discussing about the appropriation of yoga. We are simply going to be talking about when yoga went from being counterculture to pop culture. So that's a trick question. So you're saying it's a counterculture. Yeah. Yeah. It is a counterculture. It's totally a counterculture. Yeah. Well, it it is a counterculture. I was saying it's counterculture before. Trick question. I snagged it. (laughs) 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 It's a, it's a counterculture. A hundred percent it is because yoga wasn't practiced. It was mainly practiced in the East and then it was not practiced in the West. So when it was brought over through like, uh, many different forms it could have been mainly through the the vegetarian movement did help that there's a lot of movements during that time vegetarianism was was one of them to be honest well you know i'm gonna come in with a history lesson in a second so what we should talk about though is this show when we talk about counterculture that you know sinks to popular culture means the western side of popular culture it doesn't mean other popular cultures around the world. We're talking mainstream. Exactly. Mainstream. Mainstream Western culture. Right. And so the East at that point, that was their mainstream culture. 
to some people. It was accepted and to adopt it into the culture because that was part of it within the East. Dude, you, you're, it's interesting because we have this, we as generally as a population have a concept of yoga as being a practice that has, er, has existed for thousands of years. Oh my I'm, gosh, yeah. Right? Oh yeah. So many of today's yoga poses that we know it really only date back to the 19th century. That is the first written record, like record of it. So, I mean, there's, so there's a broad misconception around how old this is. Now, this is not saying like oral practice or practices uh, of tradition that have been passed down. Not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that when it comes down to actual written record, it dates back to the 1900s or 19th century. And it's kind of cool because there was this period where there was something called transcendentalism. Yes. And we are going to get into that with the Beatles too. Yes. But there's the first wave of this happened uh, in the United States in the 18, early 1800s. And that is really one of the first known Western experiences encounters with yoga well explain to people what that means because a lot of people won't understand what type of meditation that is so transcendentalism is a philosophical movement that was developed in the late 1820s and the 1830s in the eastern united states and it's based around a very simple idea that men and women equally have knowledge about themselves and the world around them that transcends or goes beyond what they know and they can see so it's connecting. So again, together we join to have a universal consciousness. And so this movement was kind of taking over the United States. And within that, there was a, in the early 1830s, and this is the first wave of transcendentalism that was coming in, and people are exploring different types of spirituality. And, you know, once you go in, if you go later into the 1800s, we're in like Victorian period, they were all like, all about the goth. They were all about the occultism. They were all about. So that kind of is like this weird defining spirituality experience for most people in the 1800s. So in the early 1800s, you have um, this fascination with the East, the, you know, their spirituality, the practices, including yoga. And within that, there was also traveling yogis that were a part of essentially sideshows and different traveling circuses and different traveling shows, which is starting to put this phenomenon of, um, you know, the contortionist yogi in everybody's forefront of everyone's mind. So this in is a negative way, not in a positive well, side I shows mean, were not a, not a good thing. They were very, very from modern, from modern sensibilities. It does not jive. No, but, it, but back then it was, it was still considered, but Hey, if you were negative, if you were somebody that lived on the outside of society, you got a job, you got a family and you got to see the world. So from they were not treated properly, nobody was treated properly. I think if, unless you were, you fit within a very small gendered stereotype, your life was not cool. But I think that, you know, at that point, if you have a job, you're like, cool, I'll put up with this. I'll deal with this. I've got food on the table. I've got money coming in. I get to travel. I have a place where I so-called belong and I can be myself. But they were objectified though. Oh, that's a whole point of it. And I think that that's where if we're using that as a sink, as an introduction to Western culture, it's a, it's a negative sink because it, it totally appropriated the, the art. And then they also, the culture that goes with it as well too. Yeah. I mean, they, the idea was, is that the contortionist yogi, which we all have that vision in our mind that was created during this early period of the 1800s. And that was going all around Europe and across North America. So in Western culture, that was one of the first experiences people were having with the idea of this Eastern. Yeah, that, that's, I guess, the way that they were learning. But it doesn't yeah. mean it was positive. No, it doesn't mean it was positive. It just meant this is the first mainstream introduction of yoga within the mainstream Western popul- populace. And it was definitely was tricks because it was contortionism. And, you know, the yogis were seen as being pretty disre- disreputable where they were not seen as like, uh, as they weren't, it wasn't desirable. It was just curious. It was a fascination for them. And then as time goes on, you know, you come into the 1920s 
let's we're just going to fast forward right to the 20s and (laughs) now we're here and now we're here and now we have our first sink first sink we're on the western coast of the united states and or we'll say second sink because we basically talked about one already but here we are on the west coast of the united states 1920s the golden age of you know hollywood greta garbo and um peter sellers was one peter's that's a little later um, oh, right. Good point. That is. Yeah. Sorry. Right. That's 19. That's we're 1960s, in the 50s 1970s, and 60s. And 70s. And 70s. Sorry, I missed my time here. Um, <laughs> but Gloria Swanson, we've got Greta Garbo. It's too far with the. We even have the cosmetic the flux capacitor. The flux capacitor. I know. Break it up. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we have Gloria Swanson. We have Greta Garbo and we have cosmetics maven Elizabeth Arden. And what are they doing? They're all practicing this really cool new thing that has come to Hollywood by way of. Here was the mother of Western yoga um, is teaching all these starlets how to do yoga. And now people know what it is. This is because it's like for femininity, you're stretching. It's such a like feminine kind of workout. It's very soft. It's not challenging. Um, Oh, Indra, her name, Michelle Gold, Goldberg wrote a book about Indra Devi. Indra Devi was the yogi that brought yoga to Hollywood in the 1920s and taught it to Greta Garbo, Gloria Swanson, and cosmetics maven Elizabeth Arden. And now everybody wants to do yoga. Well, it started it. It's one of those catalyst moments that moved it into popular culture. When you get a lot of celebrities doing one thing, we see that all the time, Scientology, tons of different things, that people jump on that bandwagon they're part of that. And yoga is a really great one. The thing is that yoga is secular. It's a secular practice. So it, anyone can do it. It doesn't, it's not connected to religion. It's not connected to politics. It's not to connected to any of those things. It's one of those things that you're able to do by yourself yeah. or with a group of people. So I'm not surprised that starlets and, and people within that time, it was something new, something cool, it's something different, but it's always kind of stayed that way as well too. Can I jump into another sink? Then? Go jump into that sink. So now we're going to get back into our time machine and whoop, and we're going to take ourselves to 1967. That was a big time for the Beatles. And so when you think of the Beatles, who brought in the idea of transcendental meditation and yoga? If you had to pick a Beatle, what Beatle would you assume that was doing that? George? Good, good. A lot of people I would imagine would say John. John. Right. But it was George. And then he ended up meeting a yogi, and I'm going to butcher this name. That's okay. But the Maharashi Maheshi yogi, where um, they all ended up going uh, out to India and stayed there for a while. And as we know, they recorded and they did. That's where the White Album started, and that's an influence from it. Um, and so that was a huge part with them. But so then they had the Maharashi travel to England in 1967 to then coach the Beatles as well, too. The the yogi became the spiritual advisor at that point. And then in June 1st, 1967, was the, the summer of love. And then the Beatles released the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. There you go. That's a tongue twister at times. And so that album was a revolution in music and in art, and they would say into spirit as well, too. And so a lot of people, I don't think, know this, but within the cover art, there's four Indian spiritual masters that are represented with the, all those group of people, all those iconic people uh, beside the rest of the Beatles as well. And we'll put that up on our Instagram as well, too. Go to Old Pop Repeat. Check that out. On Instagram. On Instagram. Plug, plug. So I think the Beatles were, in my mind, are the first catalyst and first shift for that introduction into Western culture because they were so iconic within England and within North America in general. There is a very... Because Britain occupied um, India, Right. For a number of years. So the close relationship between Britons and Indians is pretty tight. At some point that cross-pollination is going to happen. Leading into the 60s as well was the first person to popularize yoga on television, which is uh, Richard Hittleman, who pioneered yoga. And so I feel like when we're, we're talking about how these things pop into mainstream culture. Usually there's the ones that come in earlier and they break the ice. 
So totally. we have the sideshows, I hate to say it, with the contortionist yogis that are traveling around and early transcendentalism, which is making them fascinated with Eastern spirituality. Then you have also the Hollywood uh, Indra uh, Devi who is teaching yoga to Hollywood starlets. And now it's starting to go out in the masses. A few years later, you have Richard Hittleman who's bringing yoga, pioneering it on television. And he was living in New York. And then once you go from the fifties, you have, he, I think actually he debuted it. I want to say maybe in 61, he started writing books in the fifties. Um, and then you come into the sixties and here we have our favorite one of, we talk about them all the time, the hippies and the hippie movement of people who are just dissatisfied with the status quo. They feel like there should be a better way that peace, love and happiness should be those, those, the, um, epitaph that follows our entire lives. And the Beatles kind of fall into that. Now the same, like Rolling Stones, they're, they're using, um, sitars in their music. It'd be a very popular sound. It was kind of like, a, I really associate that in some ways as the sound of the hippie movement. When we go back to the Beatles, we look at, you know, we, we have George Harrison. He was also good friends with Peter Sellers and Peter Sellers is an actor. He's a comedian. Uh, he was known mainly for doing BBC radio stuff. Um, he did the goon show. Uh, and a lot of people would know him as the, I think the chief inspector Clouseau. Clouseau, thank you. Yep. Chief Inspector Clouseau uh, in from? The Pink, from the Pink Panther. Yeah. So I have a clip here of them talking about yoga and then using transcendental meditation within their life and how it's affected them. And so both of them are talking. The intro then is first of George and then Peter goes in and they both have this conversation of what it means to them. You know, he knew that there was something else in, in life. The sad thing about Peter was I don't think he fully discovered the self. He was on the, the road to that. You know, he was doing a lot of yoga and meditating and was chanting Hare Krishna. My religion is yoga. I'm a yogi, therefore a person who does yoga. Consequently, I became highly sensitive, highly tuned. And the clairvoyancy that I knew I had within me then started to blossom. Not only did I become aware of feelings, people, plants, uh, ambiances, dogs, cats, animals. When I say I became aware of them, I became aware of their personalities and also unseen people. We're not really unseen, they're only unseen if you're not sensitive. But I'm always aware of my mother's presence and, and other, many other people. So there it's kind of giving you that very much a hippie mentality right there. But what, what is it? But it's, it's also the universal consciousness. Exactly. That's what they're talking about. Right. And, and it's understanding of open mindedness and really explaining what yoga and meditation did for them. John Lennon actually did give up yoga at one point, though, and said that he didn't believe in it anymore. Uh, he did have that moment that I don't people talk about, but he kind of stepped away from it for a second. Yeah. Right. And then George Harrison, though, kept it going throughout his life. And fast forward to the fitness. You, Lululemon. A hundred percent. That has become such a trend. In 1998, Lululemon started and they started making activewear acceptable to wear every day. Yeah, but and, they were made activewear acceptable to wear in the gym because leading up to that, what were we wearing to the gym? Those yep. stupid leotards. Or sweatpants. Sweatpants were disgusting. A really crappy band t-shirt. Really crappy band t-shirt. But you look at the fitness wear. Take a look at Saved by the Bell. Take a look at what those women were wearing when they're, they're going to the gym. And it's like those high-waisted leotard with the legging underneath. But what was what you had to do, the functionality about it is what we kind of forget to look at. When you had to layer on the leotard with the, the leggings, what you were doing is you were layering to create this um, layering of fabrics in a very key part on women, which if you just wore the leotard, you would have a camel toe. The dance tight, as everybody knows who wears tights, has a very specific feature on it. This was something that was not important in clothing, but Lululemon brought it in. And this is what made Lululemon and yoga wear the talk of the town, was the invention and use of the gusset and fitness wear. 
that's what this is. And that's how women started to wear yoga pants. And you're like, wow, I look great. I look great. I don't have a raging camel toe. I don't look like I have a meaty tuck that I'm walking around like, look at. Yeah. And I also think that they decided to like Lululemon understood the mechanics of how to put a a fashionable, but also practical pant while doing yoga, but also doing multiple things for the lifestyle. First, it started for women and then it moved into men, but understanding the modern women didn't have time from going to work you know, working with their kids maybe after daycare and then finally getting an hour just to decompress within yoga, being able to do all of that from running to the grocery store to to doing all of these things that women sometimes feel that they need to do, but they don't, but feeling that they have to, and then being able to be accepted into having something fashionable that you could throw on with a tight and a shirt and it was okay. Yeah. So that's why I say it was so fashionable in that side because totally. yoga is really not about that. Let's be honest. Yoga is not about glitz and glam and let's, you know, it's not about that, but Lululemon decided to take it and move it into a modern world. So within that fashion, Lululemon is a massive sink totally. within changing it into modern day popular culture to make it acceptable to wear Lululemons or to wear yoga pants, yeah. to do something like yoga every single day, every moment of the day. And it's okay within North America, because we should point out that some parts <laughs> of Europe <laughs> I have an <laughs> yeah we'll, we don't we know but there are you're not in Europe in certain parts of Europe and around the world yoga pants are only for yoga because they're very be, tight right and so but within our context within North America it's extremely it's extremely fashionable and then now we move it's into acceptable uh, right and then we move into other people such as Kylie Jenner and all of them that are making Beyonce that are making all of these yoga fashion lines or yeah. fitness fashion lines that are making active wear, even though you're not doing active things and you're not doing yoga, they're making it so acceptable to wear it anywhere, right. like literally anywhere. Lululemon let it so that it was acceptable for moms and all these other people. But, but reason, now it's really gone into all different types of age ranges. The reason why we were able to take those pants and wear that active wear in the studio and outside the studio is because of the invention and the implementation of the gusset, which no one did it before Lululemon. And Lululemon recognized if they put this little extra little panel of fabric and any woman out there, if you take a look at, if you have a good pair of yoga pants and you look sick in, take a look, you're gonna see in between the the legs, there's like a little piece of fabric that's sewn in specifically in that area so you don't have a camel toe. Hey guys, guess what? Women don't want to walk around with a camel toe. If you decide that this is the day that you're going to do drag, just got to know, no camel toe. Or was it um, Moose Knuckle? Is the guy version of it. Right. There's no. (laughs) Anyway, it's it's such a funny thing to think of that Lululemon was able to create a yoga wear lifestyle. Exactly. Exactly. By simply making a small modification to yoga pants that allowed women to wear them all the time, all the time. And well, it became accepted. It became accepted. You didn't feel ashamed wearing it. And now yoga is not just a fitness thing. It's a lifestyle thing. Oh, yeah. It's embedded within popular culture fashion more than ever now, oh, I would say. It's it's almost expected that somebody has some degree of a yoga practice in their daily lives. Right. And let's, you know, I say if we close off this podcast, there's all different types of yoga. You don't have to wear Lululemons to do yoga. You can do your Bikram yoga, your hot yoga, which is... Bikram. I am. You if I do, do yoga, it's known as hot yoga. <laughs> you can do your right? hot yoga. You can do your yin yoga. You can do any type of yoga that you want by yourself, with other people, with pets, with whatever now. Because I think that the counterculture now has finally moved into pop and mm-hmm. people are starting to really understand that there's all different types of yoga that will work in their life. Yoga is beyond counterculture at this point. It is a part of our everyday lives. It's a part of your fitness practice. When you're doing your stretches at the end of your workout, what are you doing? Yoga. That's it. (laughs) Yoga. What are you doing? What are you doing right now, Chrissy? Yoga. What am I doing? Yoga. That's right. 
I'm in downward dog as we speak. Did the whole show in this pose? You imagine? <laughs> I can't imagine because I'm doing it right now. All the way through the show. What pose are you doing, Chrissy? Active Chrissy. <laughs> It's called Talking Chrissy. It's a really great pose. It's a really great (laughs) pose. It's embedded in our lifestyle. So with that said, go check us out at altpoprepeat.com. Yes, ma'am. Or you can check us out on social, altpoprepeat on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. And I'm going to close the show with Namaste. Namaste. (laughs) Great. (laughs)